Before we begin, uh, I feel like it's important for you to know a little bit more about myself, um, not just the companies that I've worked with or the platforms that I've been on, but my why, what drives me to do this work and why I'm speaking with you today. So, Um, I am a Caribbean American multidisciplinary designer. My mission is to continuously design experiences that help leaders positively impact the world. I aspire to create a legacy that promotes communities of color through design, leadership, speaking, and education uh, to help ensure that the next generation of designers such as yourselves are equipped with the tools necessary to build more inclusive products, services, and systems I serve as an educator and mentor uh, to many. So during this talk, I will take you on a journey, one that involves 12 additional human beings at Rhode Island School of Design, where with their help, we will look at ways in which the narrative can be altered for the good of those suffering from historically negative perceptions. I spent the past three months guiding students along a journey of designing a new narrative against racism. We began with the UX process. You all know it. It's a version of discovering, defining, designing, and delivering something for individuals. We all needed to be clear though about the steps in the design process so that we can use them while making our way through this difficult topic. This was part one of our foundation. We also explored racism in the US. We needed to set a baseline of what this meant. How deep is racism embedded into our culture? In the past few years, we've been exposed to public displays of blatant racism. But what about the actions that aren't on social media? What do they look like? To really understand the depths and destruction of racism in the US, we read a book called Cast by Isabel Wilkinson. This gave us enough context about how much racism is weaved into the fabric of this country since its inception. There were many contemporary stories and historical references in this book, many of which triggered almost every student, including myself, emotionally. It was shocking and gentle at the same time. This narrative provided the framework and reference to do the work necessary to address racism using the UX process. I would highly encourage you all to pick this book up if you have not heard of it or read it yourself. But before we began exploring these topics, we first had to look and acknowledge designers of color that aren't often highlighted in mainstream. Their stories are important. So before we tackled the larger issue of racism in the US, we learned about the individuals who pushed through a negative perception and achieved success in a field centered around designing for human behavior. So from the top left or in order, we have Miriam Brahma, product designer at Netflix, Fernando Lapos, who is a London-based Mexican designer, Shifan Chang, who is a Taiwanese-born designer, Stefan Burks, an African-American industrial designer, Nato Fukasawa, a Japanese industrial designer, and Chuck Harrison, an industrial designer and the first African-American executive to work at Sears, Roebuck and Company. I'd encourage you all to look them up for yourself to learn more about who they are and their work. So next I have the students split into teams of two. Each were given a broad topic to explore how racism occurred and ways they can address. The topics were health, education, housing, employment, entertainment, and law enforcement. Unfortunately, no team came back to me saying, hey, we didn't find any racism in that area. <laughs> but they began by first narrowing down the scope of focus within their assigned topic. Then they identified people whom to interview. This led them on their journey of discovery to finally delivering something within each topic. The team focusing on health concentrated their efforts on minorities and their access to telehealth services. Specifically with the onset of COVID-19, they explored ways to close the disparities they found and help them to have an experience they felt comfortable with and trusted. Next, the, educate, the team focusing on education concentrated their efforts on how social media 
that specifically Instagram educates people on social justice issues. They explore the difficulty of digesting and sorting through the flood of information that is promoted on their feed with the intent to help individuals make more informed decisions when trying to combat racism in the US. The team that had housing looked at how people of color are discriminated against when looking for a new home. They also uncovered the biases that influences the interactions between the buyer, a person of color, and a real estate agent that is not a person of color, exploring ways in which community can be found while going through this long and already arduous process. The team that had employment explored the issues that involve microaggressions occurring in the workplace, oftentimes be between white employees or managers and their non-white colleagues. They focus on ways to empower people of color who were dealing with these issues to confidently address them without feeling ostracized. The team that had entertainment decided to explore the filter bubble which drives social media interactivity and personalization. They extracted from this the dangers of only being fed one type of media that supports a pre-existing bias without there being options to explore a variety of thought. This isolation of thought they found in reinforces negative stereotypes and influences racist behaviors often towards people of color. And then finally, the team that had the topic of law enforcement explored ways in which police officers can better establish empathy with the community members they serve so that excessive force is not the default solution when engaging in high stakes conflict. They reviewed training protocols as, as, and ways this was already being addressed. All of these projects resulted in some solution that's just barely scratched the surface of racism, but they were able to uncover behaviors that could be addressed. They took large topics and focused on segments that were manageable in, eight, in the eight weeks that they had. Pivots occurred, confusion took place, emotions were high, but in the end, each had a solution that could potentially reshape the way in which people of color are seen when engaging with law enforcement, trying to buy a new home in a neighborhood, working with racist colleagues, digesting content on social media, both for entertainment and for education, and also how to build trust with the telehealth space. But why is this topic worth discussing? Well, UX is not just about creating apps and websites, as you all know. It's about employing a specific set of tools to unmask solutions to some of the most complex problems independent of the digital world. Jesse James Garrett says, UX design is the design of anything with human experience as an explicit outcome and human engagement as an explicit goal. Racism has always been a problem in the US. Only recently and within the past few months has it become the other pandemic, such as the killing of Breonna Taylor and the non-arrest of the officers who murdered her. Here's a fitting definition of racism provided by the Anti-Defamation League. The marginalization and or oppression of people of color based on a socially constructed racial hierarchy that privileges white people. Design is about telling a narrative through interfaces, design principles, products, materials, colors, etc. Ellen Lumpton says, designers use stories to stir emotions and quell uncertainty to illustrate facts and sway opinions. So these are the reasons why UX and racism designing a new narrative is important. But I wanna share with you now three ways in which you can begin to design a new narrative with regards to racism in the US. To begin tackling this issue and reshape the narrative, we as designers have to be curious without judgment. This means asking questions, doing research to learn more about the issues, the stories and the events that continue to tell a destructive narrative about race in this country. Some of the questions you will wanna ask yourself before going on to this exploration would be, who are the writers of the narrative? What is their motivation? Why do they wanna tell 
this racist narrative? What biases are at play? What systems are in place that continue to support racist narratives? What roles are available to help contribute to the reshaping of this narrative? Once you start getting access to the answers to your questions, embrace the unknown. You might be surprised by what you find or who's involved or how. Similar to what's involved with, the con with conducting a usability test with people, we can't predict the outcome. We can only direct our responses. Fear is a powerful emotion. It can be paralyzing. It can also cause us to shrink and sit in comfort. But that's what led us to where we are as it relates to racism, comfortability. Black people and people of color have been saying racism is alive and disrupting their lives for generations. But because it's uncomfortable to face the hard truths or have difficult conversations without judgment, the writers, the authors, and the narrators of the racial divide continue to influence many. And then finally, we have to objectively challenge what has been done when designing products, hiring people, educating future designers such as yourselves. Innovation surfaces when we shift the way we approach behavior, when we boldly ask the question that UX is known for, and that is why? Why do we do the things this way? Why haven't they been working? Why can't we try another method? With all of this being said, racism is not an overnight fix. It will take time, intention, and diligence to see a new narrative about race in America emerge. As designers, we have been taught to employ a set of powerful tools to unmask and resolve challenges in response to behaviors. Racism is a behavior learned through generations of storytelling. It can be rewritten. It's with your help that this is accomplished by all of us working together to unite our thinking, capabilities, and experiences. We can actually design a new narrative. The possibilities are endless and unknown. Now, the question that I want you to ask yourself as you continue along your journey is the following. How might you contribute to rewriting the narrative of racism in the US through design? Thank you. And thank you to the students of UX for having me um, and share this brief information with you as it relates to UX and racism. And now I'll answer some of the questions that you may have. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn also if, you, if we're not connected. Thank you so much, Vincent. Wow. I Actually, one question that I have off the top of my head is that you mentioned really, really great kind of questions to help us reflect. And I'm wondering if you have like a copy of that somewhere, because I feel like those are things that, you know, people would love to have like right in front of them every day. Yeah, absolutely. What I can do um, is I can share that. Um, I believe I can share that in the uh, chat. Yes. Yeah. So Go ahead and post those questions in the chat so that everyone can have that. Yeah, absolutely. And yes, Amber, we will have this recording available um, on our website. So don't you worry. Um, and yes, everyone, if you have questions, please, please go ahead and feel free to add them in the chat. Um, I have one question that I <laughs> wrote down myself. And you're talking about how curiosity is so powerful. And I completely agree with that. And I think that um, the question I have is specific to the fear um, part of that curiosity. And I think that as somebody who is trying to also, you know, dive into different um, pieces of work, whether that is film, whether that is um, different novels and books that you have, or like the one that you have shown, um, I sometimes have that fear kind of like shake me and be like makes me feel afraid to ask questions and to be curious and I'm curious to know if um, there are ways to instead of like maybe perhaps the word is like to reframe that fear um, and what advice you would give 
um, to people like me who do want to start conversations but feel afraid of judgment? Yeah. So I think one of the, the first things that you would have to do for yourself is to ask yourself, why are you afraid mm. to engage in the conversation, right? What about the judgment that's causing you to be hesitant to, to start? Um, and once you're able to see that for yourself and say and answer that question, okay, why am I afraid to do this? Is it because mm -hmm. of a previous experience where um, I've had the conversation and someone really went off, right? And they just took it the wrong way, or you know, I saw someone else do it and I didn't really like the results of it. But asking yourself that question, why, and really getting to the heart of that matter, I think is going to allow for yourself to say that, okay, if it's because I didn't like the response of how, when I first, when I last had the conversation or last had the question, mm -hmm. um, you can start by saying, hey, this is, this is a, a question that, I have a question that might be triggering. You can acknowledge what may actually occur Mm -hmm. um, space before you ask the question so that you sort of can prepare yourself for if you in, in relate to or not relate but if you encounter something similar right right so it also gives the person an opportunity quickly to prepare themselves uh for something that may be a little bit jarring right, right. where you feel a little bit um it may be an unexpected, the nature of the question or the, the, the way in which the conversation is going. So again, I would start with first asking yourself the question, why is it you know, keeping you from, from moving forward and asking the question? And then use what you find when you answer that question to mm -hmm. set the stage on how you engage with other people. Awesome. That, that's really, really great advice. And I think that there's a sense of like vulnerability to that. And I think that that's what people really connect to and, and appreciate. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say absolutely. Yeah. So I have another question um, from Hannah. Um, Hannah asks, how would you encourage indifferent stakeholders to engage and care about UX and racism? Huh. Um, similar to, to, to my answer to you, um, first you want to find out why are they indifferent, right? Mm. I think so oftentimes when we try to go about changing a person's mindset or a behavior without first understanding why that exists, we set ourselves up mm -hmm. <laughs> for, for really a hard time and for, um, for, for possible conflict that's not going to be productive, mm -hmm. right? when engaging with stakeholders who are indifferent, the question becomes, well, why are they indifferent, right? Mm -hmm. Because they just don't know much? Is it because they don't care? Is it because, you know, what is that, right? Mm -hmm. That's also going to give you the tools in which to engage in the conversation or even to help you make the decision on whether or not it's worth engaging. If right. they I'm indifferent because I just simply don't care. I know all of the facts. I know what's happening. Then you have to wonder, is it worth your time to really go through the back and forth with them to try and convince them, right? right. Um, indifferent in the sense that, you know, they may not have enough information or context, then mm -hmm. that's, a little bit, that's workable, right? Because then you can provide some, some opportunity or some insight uh, or information for them to be able to uh, care a little bit more um, as it relates to UX and potentially racism and how that shows up and how the two are even connected. Mm, right, yeah. That's, that's, that's the thing that kind of was emphasized in your um, response is this idea of productivity. It's like the, the conversation you should have should end up being productive. Otherwise, is it, you know, really worth your time? So thank you for that answer. Um, and another question that we have comes from Mustafa. And uh, they ask, would you consider the power of social media and memes um, as a part of rewriting this narrative? It is a part because it's a part of contributing to it. Um, uh, and so there's a way in which that can be used to, to help rewrite the narrative. Um, how I'm not, you know, we'd have to go through the whole process, right? To see right. What, 
we could use, et cetera. But in general, I think, yes, it absolutely can because it's one that, like I said, it's, it's contributed to um, a, a particular type of narrative and helping to shape and form the way in which we see people, the way in which we think about them, um, and just reinforcing certain stereotypes, right? Mm. We see a lot of you know, joking, joking memes that you know, suggest certain things about groups or communities of people that are sometimes funny, but if we constantly are engaging in those and we're constantly seeing those show up, say for example, on our feed, it does have an effect on us. And I would, it, it, I would encourage um, our support, the reference to the book um, uh, designing um, for cognitive bias, because that's a huge piece in which you know, that kind of exposure has on, on us. Yeah, for sure. Um, awesome. Yeah. And um, Rupa asks, what are other spaces in the tech world that are having discussions about racism and other oppression in design? Um, do you know of these things? And if more, they'd love to connect more with that community. Yeah, so there, there are definitely other spaces um, as it relates to specifically artificial intelligence, um, mm. facial recognition. There was a, a video, um, a documentary that was created um, by a, um, a technologist and I apologize that I'm forgetting her name, but the name of the film is Coded Bias. Um, it's available if you mm. can, Coded Bias, um, that you could, uh, you'll see the film and you could purchase it to watch and I would highly encourage you all to invest in that. Um, it's about $10, I believe, to watch the film. Um, and it explores and talks about how um, these types of racial biases and stereotypes or just the, the, the trickling effect of how not having a diverse set of individuals or making the or creating the technologies that we use. Mm -hmm. uh, how that is uh, negatively affecting um, oftentimes people of color. And so um, that's one area in which um, that is, that's having the conversation right now. That's awesome. Um, that's really good to know. And yes, I've, ha I've heard, I think like I've seen some headlines about AI and how uh, facial recognition itself has actually become racist in a way. Um, and now Di Carlos um, is interested to learn more about what the team focused on um, the workplace um, when and what they found in terms of addressing these uh, microaggressions. So if you could talk a little bit more about that. The project, yeah. So um, that particular team, what they did was they found that through their interviews, that individuals were not um, individuals who work at uh, different places um, that were experiencing uh, racism. They were unsure about it, right? Because these were sort of microaggressions where it wasn't like blatant, right? It was mm. subtleties in which how they were being approached or how. Uh, uh, they were being engaged with their uh, colleagues. So, for example, one of the one of the references that they used um, was the fact that there was an, uh, a woman of color who um, who shared an idea during a meeting. Mm. No one really paid attention to her idea or acknowledged the idea, and then her white male colleague said the exact same idea and was uh, was acknowledged, was congratulated, and was moved. Um, and and they moved on with the idea after he suggested it, um, ignoring the fact that it was just shared by this woman of color. And so oh that gosh. deflated her um, and made her feel less than. And so what they did was they created a solution that allows for people who experience microaggressions in the workplace to be able to report them without feeling um, ostracized, right? So mm. one of the other things that they found in their research was that the people who were experiencing these things, they were, they were less likely to go to their managers or to go to HR to talk about these things because they weren't necessarily sure if it was just something in their head or, you know, if this was really actually occurring for them. Right. And this would allow for some, for them to reflect and immediately report something um, through this sort of seamless way, as well as get access to support, supporting resources so they can be counseled and they can sort of help to be walked through this process if they were to ever encounter it again. 
Wow, that's fantastic. Is there a way that we can like learn more if like, I don't know, like about these studies that you did? Because I'm like, I'm so curious now. Um, so if you have those, definitely, um, if you send them to us, we'll we'll share them with the group because that that's really profound. And I think that it's so um, it's so sad in a way that microaggressions have been normalized somewhat. And so I think that it's very inspiring that, you know, this group of people are, you know, finding ways around that to, to change the UX uh, design of that. So that's awesome. Yeah, um, so what I mean, actually, um, mm -hmm. cause I go into each one of those projects just for the sake of time, but, um, what I am doing and already have written is a, as the retrospective of mm. the project that the students have done. And I will be sharing the links to their Medium article. So I had each student uh, create and write a retrospective of their projects um, and post it on Medium. And I referenced it and told them um, on our last day that I will be sharing this so that other people can get access because I think that the work that they did was fantastic. And the kind of information that they were able to uncover through the short amount of time was really substantial. And j just in imagining, you know, if you had, you know, a year's worth of time and dedication and resources to, to put towards some of these topics, what could actually happen? So if you follow me on LinkedIn, be, uh, this will probably be out in the earlier part of next week, uh, where I will be sharing the links to uh, my students' work and what they learned and how they went through the process, et cetera. That's fantastic. I, I know I just saw this on the chat and someone was like, can I, Sarah was like, can I take your class? <laughs> it's like, I'm sure so many of us would want to take your class. So um, it, are you just um, kind of on a tangent right now, but like, are you just teaching in specific universities or do you have a course, you know? Well, this is, this is it's funny that this question is asked because I, I was specifically, I created this curriculum specifically um, to teach at uh, Rhode Island School of Design. And mm -hmm. um, this is something that, you know, obviously I created, but um, I won't be teaching it again um, at the, the institution. And so I've been sort of thinking about uh, what could this look like outside of an institution and so that people can have access to going through this process because it was a very, um, it was a very intimate process and it was really structured in a way that we can, you know, go through this sensitive topic in a way that allows for us to not be overwhelmed, but really address some issues that taken further because some of the students, many of the students project, they are things that can be implemented um, in some of the platforms that they decided to, to partner with. Um, and a couple of them are, in, are thinking about continuing to move forward with their, with their projects in terms of developing it out more just because of what they learned in the process. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, we're going to uh, look forward to, the, to, to seeing more of that. Um, all right. Understand the need. If people want it, then I, you know, I can work on making it happen. You guys put on the chat. Uh, all right. So we have, we have a few more questions. So Sarah asks, how can, um, how can we center voices that are usually not centered during the UX process? And so perhaps um, this might uh, speak to, I don't know if, if Sarah, if you meant like um, when we do personas or stuff like that, maybe you can clarify that, but what do you um, hear from that, Vincent? Yeah, I would actually like more clarity on that. Okay. Um, whether it's, you know, from the individuals who uh, we're designing for, or if it's uh, from the individuals who are participating in the creation of, uh, the thing, um, if it's so, I'll, I'll I'll take on both, if you will. Um, so when it comes to the individuals who we're designing for, that's simply about really making sure that when we're casting a net of people who we want to design for, that are say, for example, our screener surveys mm -hmm. are, are allowing for that that diversity of data, and also how we're putting out that information to get access to individuals. Um, that's one way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, make sure that we are making sure that those voices are being heard and at the center of how we move forward. The other, as it relates to the individuals who are a part of 
um, the creating the solution. Well, that mm -hmm. just falls down to hiring and who's a part of um, the team, essentially. Right. Right? Um, and that is something that's the responsibility of, you know, managers and HR and leaders within this field, mm -hmm. um, you know, them taking on the responsibility of really looking at how they can continue to diversify the individuals who are playing a role in the products that we are creating and the products that um, uh, are being experienced by other people. For sure. No, yeah. Thank you for answering that question. Um, I think that something that relates to that, um, Vicky asks, what are some ways that junior designers or new desi designers can advocate more about this topic um, and not feel, again, afraid to do so um, as, you know, we're not necessarily uh, uh, a voice of authority? Maybe that's the right way. Yeah. I love Krupa. I love this question as well. Um, I have gotten this question whenever I have led talks about um, design and diversity within UX with, with my previous classes. And really the best thing that you can do as a junior designer is ask questions. Mm. That's really the best thing that you can do um, because you're being, you're, when you're hired, right? They're hiring you for your design capabilities, but they're also hiring you for your intellect and your personality, right? And so by you coming on board to a team, no, you cannot say we should do this, right? Mm -hmm. You're seeing, even if you're seeing something not happening, you want to ask the question to see if other people are aware of what it is that you see as well. Right? right. So you genuinely curious about, hey, I noticed that when we were doing this usability test, there weren't many people of color. I'm curious, was that on purpose or what are we what are we looking for in this? Right. Mm -hmm. um, one that allows for you to just get understanding. Right. Um, and not to ask the question to point fingers and saying you're not doing your job, manager. You're not doing your job, person. Yeah check right because you can't you can't really you know push buttons in that yeah. way and ask questions just like you normally would as you're trying to learn how to best do your job right mm -hmm. as a designer and so that is really there's so much power in asking questions uh when you see things happening right and pointing out things that are just plain and, and, and obvious right yeah. um and not making any assumption that okay, did they not just see that also, right? right. Why are they not saying anything, yeah. right? You should ask the question and be that voice. And that's how you participate as a junior designer. The more questions you ask, um, the more you get insight to the, the, the nature of the environment that you're in, right? Mm -hmm. And the individuals that you're working with. Also, they get to see your perspective and what you're paying attention to, because if you find that you're constantly having to ask these questions to sort of um, poke holes into things that are taking place that aren't really positive, then that may be speaking to where you might, how long you want to stay at this organization or, you know, where you want to move forward. Right. Um, <laughs> But it also could could posi position you in a in a place where if they're seeing that you're paying attention to these things and they may give you some more responsibility, right? So right. you never know where that could lead. Um, so I would definitely encourage you all to when you get your jobs to ask questions. It's not a problem to ask questions, just like you're taught to ask questions in an interview. When they're interviewing you, you're interviewing them to find out about what the company is like. You have to do the same when you get in there. That is such a really good way to like, like, I think that also speaks to this like curiosity and like how much if companies value like, hey, ask questions, ask those questions and take advantage of that. So that's awesome. And I think we'll take one last question. Um, and this question is from Sophia. And Sophia asks, what is your take on the BIPOC slash B-A-M-E people in tech? Um, on what they should do following on from what happened to Dr. Timnit Jebru at Google. Um, mm -hmm. For context that, right, she was leading AI research and got fired unceremoniously for her research concerns. Yeah, um, this is a fresh topic and I have been following the articles and reading. I just actually read some more information about it today about the response mm. uh, to that, uh, you know, for, for the firing. and. 
to be quite honest, I think it's it's still something that obviously it shows that we still have ways to go. Ultimately, is where my, my perspective. It, that's what, what it highlights for me is that we still have to engage in, in a way that helps to normalize this conversation around race and not it being so taboo, right? And being afraid to just acknowledge and be vulnerable. It's like, we messed up, right? Or this was done wrong. Mm. Or you know whatever the case may be, and I think that we're in a we're in a time where um, where that used to be okay, right? Where it used to be okay to kind of like passively push things to the side and and ignore that um, you know there has been an occurrence when it comes to discrimination with an employee, specifically with um, with um, I forget her name now. Um, uh, um, with Dr. Timnit Jabru. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we have to now face it because now people have access to, um, you know, to this information to make decisions and to see what's occurring. And so I think, again, for me, it's, it's shining a light to the level of responsibility that we all mm -hmm. have, that leaders really have to take account for what's occurring and how they are treating their employees, especially um, BIPOC employees and, and making sure that they are not uh, silenced in a way where if they bring up something that seems to be uncomfortable for a majority of the individuals who are in an organization, that they're not, you know, sent on their way because they caught of they stir the waters, if you will, right? Right. Because um, the reality is, as I mentioned in this talk, is that, you know, racism is something that is huge and it is embedded in this country for generations. Like, this isn't just something that just popped up in 2020 or 2016. Right. So, a lot of things that have been shared with us, told to us, that's embedded in all of our biases, right? And so it shows up unconsciously through the way in which behave, we behave, how we talk, who mm -hmm. we engage, and the decisions that we make. And so by constantly surfacing and pointing out when these things occur, we have to take serious account to who's saying it and what they're saying and listen to what's actually uh, occurring for them um, and take appropriate action and not dismissing them. So that's my overall thought about this issue that's occurring right now um, um, with Dr. Timnit. So um, yeah, it's, it's a great thing to be talking about. Um, and it's just a small fraction of, again, a reflection of what's actually, what's actually taking place within this country and even the world at large. Absolutely. And I think in, in a way like this notion that you um, mentioned of, you know, being able to acknowledge this and being able to see that there's a, still a long ways to go, but we are, you know, slowly, even with talks like these are doing something productive. And I think that's, that's something at least that I'll take with me today and um, find that encouraging, but also almost like uh, very much motivation to, you know, keep learning and keep uh, growing and keep asking questions and you know, keeping on being curious and uh, not being afraid, really. So, Vincent, thank you so much for this amazing event. I definitely have a lot to take in, and I'm sure that, you know, other people did have other questions. So, I'll, we'll encourage them to uh, add you on LinkedIn and ask those questions to you personally as well. Um, as students of UXD, thank you so much for being here today with us. And we really appreciate your time, Vincent. Thank you. I appreciate